I will, and I will rephrase briefly any questions so that everybody can hear it and also so that the video can pick it up. If there are questions or comments. Yeah. Uh, and taken in that spirit, the, the question has to do with, while fully acknowledging and honoring uh, the great gifts that we have all inherited from Thoreau and the people who've carried on his work since his death, uh, what shortcomings, or at least what limitations, might one see, or might, what might I see today in Thoreau in terms of addressing uh, contemporary problems? I've thought a lot about this. It's a very important question. But briefly, Thoreau was so devoted, and appropriately so, to, devo to uh, celebrating and emphasizing individual conscience, individual reflection, and self-reliance that he neglected, and in some, to some degree, in some passages, he was hostile towards the communal dimension of our existence. On a much more crowded planet, where events happening in Shanghai or in Baghdad or in Concord can have an effect on one another, in a much more crowded, much more interconnected planet, we have to think and act, bearing in mind the fact that we are social creatures and that we are woven into this web of relationships, economic, political, cultural, anthropological relationships with other humans. And that seems to me the greatest shortcoming in Thoreau's work. Uh, he, was, he was preoccupied with establishing the individual's right and, in fact, responsibility to think for himself or herself and not simply to take on, not to conform to the social norms. Another limitation to my own way of thinking, uh, at least in terms of illuminating my life and the lives of many other people, I suspect, is that uh, Thoreau never had the good fortune to marry and, and raise children. The strong suspicion that he would have liked doing both, and he was clearly adored by children, and would, I think, have been a remarkable, if irascible, father. <laughs> a challenging father, but I think a really nurturing father in the end. Uh, and that's, that's just a circumstantial limitation. He, he simply didn't write out of that experience. He observed families, he was part of a family, but he didn't himself take on the responsibility for a family uh, of his own children and a spouse. And that's just a circumstantial limitation. But since it is still the case that most human adults live uh, in such a setting, not all by any means, of course, but most human adults live in such a setting, uh, there's a dimension missing from his writing and from his days, that a dimension that's profoundly important to me. And so I've had to turn to other places for that. And one other, one other limitation, and, and I'll stop because, like yourself, I, I say these things within the context of a profound gratitude towards Thoreau, who has been an instructor to me m my whole adult life. One other shortcoming I'll mention is uh, partly a function of the brevity of his life, the tragic, tragically tragic brevity of his life, but partly a kind of restless temperament that he himself alludes to. Uh, his effort of observation, his effort of recording his observation and reflections was sustained in a, an extraordinary way. But he didn't sustain any, any creation of an institution. The folks who created this Thoreau Society, for example, or of a farm, or of an enterprise. And much of what's most valuable to us as human beings is the result of sustained effort to create institutions or to, to, to wed oneself to an institution, whether it's a church or a school or an organization, um, to, to commit oneself over the long haul to such an effort. And that simply was not part of his life. Yes, sir. Again, it's a complex and, and large question, but the briefest formulation of it is, what do I, as I look at contemporary American society, where would I start in reforming it, if anybody had listened to my suggestions? Where would I start in reforming it? Uh, I think taking back the public airwaves for the public. Our political system, our, 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 the funding of politics, both parties, this is not a Republican or Democratic issue. The funding of both parties is driven primarily by the cost of buying time on the public airwaves. And the public airwaves 
are licensed by us, the citizens of the United States of America. I think the first thing I would do, because it's the simplest, easiest, and cleanest, would be to take back the public airwaves and require all broadcasters, if they're going to use the public airwaves, to carry political debates, political messages, in an equitable way, free, which would get 80% of the cost out of political campaigns. Then there would be a chance that our political system, which includes, of course, the regulators who are appointed and overseen by the political system, the Federal Communication Commission, for example, Food and Drug Administration, all, the, the, all these other regulatory agencies, there would be some chance that we would actually reclaim our own government for democracy. So that, what is, so that it would be making decisions out of a concern for the common good, asking the question, what is good for the American people, for the land? What is good for the future generations? Or even a simpler question, what is good for children? If we ask that question, imagine that. If businesses, if politicians, if advertising agencies ask the question, what is good for children? And really took that seriously. Most, we would make radical changes in our economy. We'd make radical changes in our militarism. We'd make radical changes in our schools. So I would start by taking back the public airwaves, um, taking corporation funding and other kind of um, special interest funding out of politics and reclaim the government and the regulatory agency and the agencies and the courts, the judicial system of America for democracy, which it is a long, all of which are a long way from democracy now. <laughs> any, any, uh, to acknowledge or claim any shortcoming for Henry David Thoreau and this company, I realize it's going to, <laughs> it's going to provoke resistance. Um, I, think that, I think among the many uh, instructions I have received from Thoreau is the one that I cited at the beginning. Where, his, where what he responded to the young farmer was, don't try to become a clone of me. He doesn't use that language, obviously. Don't try to become a clone of me. That's my, not my purpose. My purpose is to think to the roots of my existence, my Henry David Thoreau's resistance. And I'm inviting you to do the same. And I certainly honor the many, many things that he did in his life. Those are not a what you, all of what you listed are not a significant part of his writing. And what what uh, people who are not scholars of Thoreau's life and are not privy to the many, many rich stories that circulate in this neighborhood, for example, about him and his family. People who are not privy to that, which include my students, unless I pass on some of them to them, what they have is him on the page. And I would stand by what I said earlier about his shortcomings on the page. Uh, while acknowledging, we need to stop. I'm very well aware of uh, Mark Twain's comment that the most dangerous place to stand is between an audience and lunch. 